Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential Baroque orchestral works for beginners. And I have segregated Baroque music from later music in terms of the handling of the orchestra and also in chamber forces because Baroque music has its own stylistic parameters. And I think it makes sense, especially if you're starting out, to, to segregate that music so we can listen to it and focus on what those are. It's important to understand that it's not inferior because it's earlier or you know, classical music wasn't more sophisticated or highly developed. It's nothing like that. It's a question of aesthetics, what the aesthetic standard of the period was. And the aesthetic standard of the period for Baroque music was very, very simple in essence. It was this. All music consisted of solo voices accompanied by something. That was the way people in the Baroque period thought of music. There, were, there was the tune on the top, and there could be multiple voices singing the tune. They could be singing in counterpoint. They could do all kinds of things. But the bottom line was that the job of accompaniment was relegated to something called the continuo, the continuity. Get, get it? That's where the word comes from, the continuo. And what the continuo consisted of was a keyboard instrument of some kind, usually a harpsichord or an organ, or in small, small arrangements, it could be a guitar or anything, anything that could make a complete mass of harmony, you know, playing a bunch of chords at the same time or notes at the same time to make full chords. And, and then on the bass line, the bottommost line of that harmony, you would have a cello or a double bass or something low to, to really reinforce the, the root, the fundament of that harmony. And that was called the continuo. And there was an entire set of rules um, for how to realize the continuo because composers wrote to the extent they wrote it down at all. A lot of the time it was just improvised and assumed it would be there. And composers wrote for it in a kind of shorthand that the performers would realize um, ex tempore um, over the course of the performance. And so you've heard it. You know, if you listen to the radio, if you've heard anything Baroque, which is basically music written before around 1760-ish, uh, you will hear, you know, whether it's an orchestra or a single voice or a solo violin, a harpsichord and a cello and bass or some, some version of that clonking around underneath everything and supporting these vocal lines. Now, that can be a little difficult, I think, for beginners to assimilate because some people find the sound of those instruments to be extremely annoying. I mean, a harpsichord can be kind of irritating. An organ is less irritating and sometimes it evaporates entirely. Nowadays, with the period instrument movement to try and reproduce, you know, authentic sonorities, the harpsichord can be substituted with a forte piano or other early keyboard instrument, of which there were dozens of different types. Um, so you get you get a lot more color now, frankly, than you used to. Um, one of the problems I find with recordings, quite often, of Baroque music is that the continuo um, part is usually realized by the conductor, you know, because in Orchestras in Baroque days didn't really have conductors either. I mean, big theatrical productions would have conductors, but as often as not, these people sat at the keyboard and might wave their hands around a little. And the first violin guy was the guy who really led the orchestra, and it was a communal activity. And so, and so there wasn't really a conductor. But today we're used to having one guy in charge. And when you see recordings of Baroque music, you will see the name of the person in charge. It's John Elliott Gardner, or it's Trevor Pinnock, or it's, you know, one of these people. And most of these people, Christopher Hogwood, most of these people were keyboard people. And as a result of that, the continuo part, which really should be subordinate to the tune, <laughs> for example, is often horrendously over -miked and over-recorded and far too loud and far too prominent, I believe. Because when I see these people perform live, it's totally different. The balances are totally different. You know, because a harpsichord doesn't have a lot of dynamic range. So it is what it is. And if it's a slender-toned instrument, then it's not going to be very loud. It's just there. 
And that's what it really ought to sound like. The further back it is, the better. And I can't control that, and neither can you. So we have to be prepared um, either way. These things should not sound like harpsichord concertos. That is music for harpsichord with everyone else accompanying the harpsichord. That reverses the balance and the aesthetic principles on which the music is based. And you would think that people supposedly versed in authentic performance practice and all of these rules and orthodoxies of, of original instruments and how things were performed back then would know that <laughs> and would do something about it. But, you know, when the ego of the performer comes into conflict with, you know, the academic academic tradition or the rules of performance, what do you think is going to win? Yes, exactly. So I, I just want to make that point. And this is why I want to treat Baroque music separately, because it will sound different from music in the classical period. I mean, there was a long transitional period and there was a lot of, you know, you'll hear a lot of classical pieces played on period instruments with a harpsichord on the bottom, even though it's not required. It's not necessary musically because people may think that's the way it may have been done. I mean, there, it, it's, it's not it's not tidy. It's a mess. The musical world is always a mess. You should get used to that. But that's the Baroque aesthetic. And so I, I want to just make that clear. And all of these pieces are part of that. Now, Baroque in orchestral music, that is orchestral music, is really easy. I mean, it's really easy to, to differentiate because there are only two kinds, basically. There are concertos, which is, you know, music for any number of soloists from one to several and accompanied by the orchestra. And the form of the concerto is basically that of the opera aria. It's vocal music written for instruments. These, these soloists think of them as singers. And the normal form of the aria is you have a opening called a ritornello and because it keeps coming back and and the ritornello gets played and the singer would come in and do some thing and a little bit of the ritornello would come back then the singer would do a little more thing and the ritornello would come back then the singer would sing and maybe stop and add some flashy improvised cadenza or something and then the ritornello would come back and end it i mean that's the basic form of an aria in the baroque period and it is also the basic form of most baroque concertos at least their first movements and possibly their last movements. The middle movements could just be, you know, a song all the way through where the solo is lightly accompanied by the continuo and the, or the rest of the orchestra, which was almost always just strings, a string orchestra. If you had woodwinds, if you had an oboe or horns or something, they would be soloists. They would not be part of the accompaniment because because the Baroque aesthetic required that instruments of that kind of unique timbre be solo instruments, be vocalists. So that's what you have. You have concertos on the one hand, and then you have overtures or suites on the other hand. Now, the Baroque overture or suite is rather different from what we've talked about in our discussions of you know, other suites for orchestra or, or overtures for orchestra. An overture in those days was not just the overture. The overture was the actual thing called the overture, which was usually um, in the French style. I mean, there were two styles. There was the French style and the Italian style. You don't have to get into it, but the, the French style had a march at the beginning, followed by a rapid section that was usually a fugue. That is something very contrapuntal with several, several lines going on at once. And then after the overture, I mean, the overture was an overture. It was a beginning. It, it introduced something. And what it introduced would be a suite of dances. And these dances were, were national dances. In other words, they were, they were the kinds of dances you would find in various European countries. And they would be, you could pick whichever ones you wanted in, in your suite. There were some standard ones. Uh, the standard ones, for, in case you're curious, were the, the Allemande, the Courante, the Sarabande, and the Gigue was a jig, a jig, you know. And these were French and German and English and Italian, basically, or Spanish, you know. They were, they came from all these different countries. And in addition to those, you could add whatever ones you want. Now, this overture and suite formula 
this type of, of setup had, you know, infinite variety because you could have any kinds of dances you wanted. You could, you know, do an overture that was, it was, you know, very solemn and pompous or lighter and more lively to introduce your suite. The only thing they have in common is that most of the pieces would be in the same key to provide a sense of sort of overall unity to the piece, to the work. And it didn't matter whether you were writing for orchestra or for a single harpsichord or piano or keyboard or organ. The suites are always based on that basic formula, just as concertos are always based on the same basic formula. And that, in essence, is Baroque orchestral music. It's really all you need to know about it. And so I have here a list of 10 splendid introductions to uh, Baroque orchestral music. And let's get to them. Number one. Vivaldi, The Four Seasons. Now, we all know The Four Seasons. You've heard it a million times. You may have seen the movie with Cal Burnett and Alan Alda and all of those people. I mean, it's a wonderful piece. It's actually part of a larger work. The Four Seasons consists of four, because there are four seasons, violin concertos, each of which has three movements and each of which is attached to a poem about the season in question. So this is also program music. In other words, it illustrates what's described in the poem. And some recordings will have the poems and some won't, but you can Google them if you're curious while you're listening. So the, the actual work, The Four Seasons, comes from a series of 12 violin concertos. It's just the first four, um, which Vivaldi called the contest between invention and harmony or something like that. And it's his Opus 8. It was published as Opus 8, 12 violin concertos, Opus 8, um, and the contest between invention and harmony. And included in that are the Four Seasons. And so you can either just listen to the Four Seasons or you can get the whole enchilada of 12 violin concertos. Vivaldi wrote something, I think, what was it, like 600 concertos? There's a lot of them. The thing about Baroque music is there's a lot of it. And one of the reasons there's a lot of it is because the, the style of writing was somewhat formulaic. I mean, you know, once you had your continuo, you wrote out, you know, the solo part. And sometimes you didn't even do that very much because you would rely on the soloist to improvise a lot of it as you went along. And you did your accompaniment on a few lines and voila, you had your concerto or your suite. And so, and so, and, and the forms were tended to be rather concise and somewhat shorter. So that allowed for mass production. And there is tons of this stuff. And it's the other reason to sort of take it slowly and digest it while you can. So that's our first concerto. And we have a little bit of everything here. Next, Bach, the six Brandenburg concertos. The Brandenburg concertos are named after the Margrave of Brandenburg, um, for whom Bach wrote these people. It was a job application. He was hoping that the Margrave would give him work. Didn't work at all. And actually, had he not made this beautiful presentation copy of the score and sent it to the Margrave, who of course stuck it in the basement or in his you know, library in a cupboard, we would not have these works at all. Um, because that is the only surviving copy of them, although Bach reused their music in other things later on, because all Baroque composers recycled stuff everywhere. Um, and the six Brandenburg concertos are in some ways considered to be the apotheosis of the Baroque concerto. Each one is written for a different group of soloists. The fifth um, Brandenburg concerto is, has gone down in history as the first ever keyboard concerto, because here the harpsichordist plays a continuo part, but is also a soloist. And that had never been done before. So Bach was an innovator. He and his son, C.P.E. Bach, kind of invented the, um, the keyboard concerto, which became the piano concerto. Before then, keyboard instruments were always accompanimental when they occurred with other instruments. They could be solo, of course, when they played alone. But when they were in a group, they, they did the harmony part. They were the accompanists. And so the fifth Brandenburg concerto has a fabulously amazing solo cadenza, which means cadence, it means a big solo spot in the first movement, and it goes on forever. It's fascinating for the harpsichordist. And, but there are also other solo instruments in these groups. There's a violin, there's a trumpet concerto, there's one for you know, recorders and flute things. There's, there's, there are a couple of them just for strings. Numbers three and six are solely for string orchestra. 
and the actual soloists are simply members of that orchestra. It's essentially the mel- the melody on the top that comes up and down and you know changes changes character periodically depending on who gets it. So, but the concerto concept remains the same. It remains solo lines, vocal lines over an accompaniment. So the six Brandenburgs are really major and delightful and fun to listen to. The next is a suite. Handel's Music for the Royal Fireworks. Now, the Music for the Royal Fireworks has a huge overture and then a selection of dance or march numbers. It was written for, a, a, you know, a, a, a state occasion fireworks celebrating the, the peace of, of Aix-la-Chapelle or something like that in, in 1748. And the fireworks went wrong, and and the, the the whole platform blew up, and there was it was a, not a happy occasion. And the piece was written solely for a wind band with no strings, a huge, huge wind band. In fact, one of the largest ever assembled by anybody. It has like nine horns and nine trumpets and twenty four oboes and twelve bassoons, and and you can get it in its original version, or you can get it in a later arrangement that Handel made that has strings. Um, and it has timpani, and it had it has snare drums going off. And, oh my God, it's wonderful, absolutely amazing. Everyone loves it, and rightly so. It's it's stunning. So the fireworks music is your first example of a suite. People tend to think of it not as uh, you know part of a larger category of works because it's just so distinctive and so much fun. But it is a a typical Baroque suite, although nothing Handel ever did was typical. I mean, it's. It's astonishingly great. So after that, now here's a piece I talked about recently in another video, one of the Dave's Faves videos, by a French composer named Jean Ferry Rebel. It's called The Elements, Les Elements. And the elements in those days, of course, were earth, air, fire, and water, the Greek elements. And he is describing in the music how they evolved out of chaos. And so to do chaos, he does about what you might expect someone doing chaos. He stomps up and down on his harpsichord. He uses this opening chord, which is like, it contains something like 9, 10, 11, 12 notes of the scale. It's like when you go to the piano, just go bang on all the keys. And from this chaos, this atonal chaos, eventually the different instruments of the orchestra, which are like flutes and strings, and they gradually differentiate themselves, after which comes a wonderful little suite of dances celebrating the the arrival of order. And it's just wonderful. It's absolutely marvelous. But this overture is not your typical overture to a suite. It is chaos. It's a tone poem, which you might call a symphonic poem almost, although they didn't have symphony orchestras in the traditional sense, which is wonderful. It's a totally unique piece of music, and it's so much fun to listen to, and so unlike anything else of the period, and you'll really enjoy it if you have a chance to listen to it. So it's a rebel, the elements. It's a different kind of suite, and it's one that reminds us that although I give you the parameters, we always have to be open to the fact that no one has to follow the rules, at least not all the time, and a lot of what fascinates us in this music is the way in which it doesn't follow the rules, the way in which it's unique, it differentiates itself and becomes something absolutely special. And Rebel is one of those pieces. Rebel, pardon me. So after that, another unique guy, Zelenka, Jan Dismas Zelenka. Now he spent most of his career, he died in the 1730s, somewhere in there, in Dresden. And in case you're wondering, the Baroque period was a very, very long period. It went from the early 1600s, you know, 1600, let's say 1600, 1605-ish, from Monteverdi's opera Orfeo, from about that point, around 1608, somewhere in there, to to the death of Bach and Handel, which was around 17, well, Bach died in 1750, Handel 1763, I think, something like that. So uh, around that period, uh, and, and that's a very, very long time, an extremely long time. It would even better than calling it the Baroque would be to call it the Continuo period, because that's what characterizes the music, the presence of that that harmony ensemble that does that particular job accompanying the the instrumental lines above. Now, Zelenka was a Czech composer who spent most of his career in Dresden, and he primarily wrote church music, um, and wonderful, wonderful church music. I mean, he was he was a real character 
Nobody knows very much about him. He was highly admired by Bach. He, there's very, very little instrumental or orchestral music. Prime, primary amongst his orchestral output are these five, he called them capriccios. They are, in fact, suites, um, but they sound like nothing else in the Baroque period. He had, uh, uh, well, how do you describe it? He had certain habits that are really recognizable, that make his music so personal and so much more identifiable than so much other Baroque music. I mean, you know, Baroque music does admittedly, because of its, you know, stylistic uniformity, um, often has um, a certain monotony about it. I mean, people could write hundreds of thousands of pieces and they all kind of sound like everything else. And that's a joke, you know, Vivaldi wrote the same concerto 600 times. I mean, statements like that are only true as long as you don't bother to listen to it. Because once you listen to it, you realize that each thing is a you know, unique organism that has to be accepted on its own basis. But the procedures are similar. And, and who has the time to listen to 600 concertos, even assuming that they'd all been recorded, or you could somehow study them all? Uh, you know, it's a lifetime. And so, and so it's easier to simply generalize and say, well, it all kind of sounds the same. And casually, it does. But what I want to tell you is that if you pay attention to it, it doesn't you begin to realize that these composers, composers have their individual personalities. And Zelenka's individual personality was a big one, a really big one. His music is tuneful. It sometimes sounds recognizably Czech. The movements that he uses for his, his dances are not always the usual dances. There's some very interesting little movements. There's one called Il Furibundo, the Furious Man. There are little character pieces that are descriptive rather than merely the typical dance pieces, like an Allemande or a Saraband. I mean, he does those too, but there's also all this other stuff. They are all His music is also incredibly virtuosic, especially for the horns and the wind players. They have, it has stratospherically high and difficult parts and f crazy flashes of insane, insane virtuoso technique. It's wonderful stuff. And he wrote five capriccios. Usually people wrote works in groups of six or 12. He only did five, as far as we know. There may have been more, there may have been a group of six. We, we don't know. Not all of his music survived intact. But these five capriccios are, are outstandingly characterful works from the Baroque period. And they're wonderful to listen to because they do show that within this style, again, you know, genius matters. And we can tell who those people are because you can hear the difference. And Zelenka is one of those guys. It's really hot. It's great stuff. After Zelenka, Corelli. Now, Corelli, the Italian Corelli, who published very little of his work, um, only, uh, you know, a few small series of sonatas, you know, solo works for, you know, solo instrument and continuo and, and a set of concertos. But he worked on them and polished them incessantly, and they were published around the 1690s. And his concertos are a little different from some of the other ones, like the Four Seasons. The Four Seasons are what we call solo concertos, because there is one solo instrument, in this case a violin, and the rest of the orchestra. Um, the Bach, Brandenburg Concerti, have a mixture of solo concerti and that which Corelli is doing, which is called the Concerto Grosso, which just means grand concerto, big concerto. In a Concerto Grosso, you have two unequal groups of instruments. You have usually a, a string trio, like a violin and a viola and a cello, or two violins and a cello, a little group, and then you have the full group, and it's all string orchestra with that harpsichord on the bottom playing the continuo. There are 12 concertos in this particular batch, and they are the, the, they are the works that established the idea, the form of the concerto grosso. And after that, most Baroque concertos were either solo concertos, a la some of Vivaldi and some of Bach, or they were concerti grossi, which is the plural, um, which means just a, a, a piece for two unequal sized clumps of instruments. And clump number two, the little clump, could have absolutely anything in it. They are lovely, sunny, incredibly attractive and appealing works, um, which uh, you'll, you'll enjoy immediately. One of them, one of the most famous ones, is called the Christmas Concerto, 
because it has a pastoral movement, which is something that was often associated with Christmas music, you know, the, the shepherds and the, the manger and that kind of stuff. And you have these sweet little lullaby-like pieces that were associated with the Christmas season. So Corelli's Concerti Grossi were unbelievably famous. And one of the greatest tributes to Corelli, who actually was a friend of Handel's, Handel knew him in Italy, and Corelli participated in the initial performances of Handel's works in Rome, which is really kind of cool, you know, to have that guy leading the orchestra in your work when you're a young composer. Anyway, Handel wrote his Concerti Grossi, 12 of them, Opus 6. Corelli's were also 12, Opus 6. And Handel definitely did this on purpose as a tribute to Corelli. He wrote his own grand concerti, and these, it's Handel. So if it's Handel, it's big. Handel is big and long and noty and tuneful and just unbelievably full of fun and completely unpredictable. You never know what he's going to do. And these concerti grossi are, are just delicious. I mean, they are so much fun to listen to. And every single one of them is different and has a different arrangement of movements and a different pattern of, you know, tension and release and climax. And, you know, you, you've... You, you have to take them one at a time. And I really suggest, when it comes to listening to the Handel Concerti Grossi, Opus 6, that you just, just take a look, see what he's going to do. Most of the movements are quite short. Some of them are less than a minute. They have just unbelievable variety of tempo and, 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 and melody and whatnot. And, and just take them one at a time and see which ones really turn you on. They were actually written and used to be performed as interlude music in his opera performances, which were already three and a half hours long. And he would stick, you know, a concerto between the various acts or, or in some places and whatnot, or as intermission music, you know. You got your money's worth in those days. You really, really did. But this is one of the great sets of Baroque concertos. Again, they're just phenomenal. And they really are uh, essential listening. And when I say essential, I mean essential. These are, these are, are iconic works. And you'll, you'll want to know them. You may not want to listen to them every day or to hear them all the time. Or it may take you, it took me years to get into them. It really did. Just because I was so used to romantic and classical period music and the sound of these pieces was so different to my ears from what I was used to and it just took me a lot of time to finally get into it but the point is not to push it to let it happen and if you are immediately attracted great and if it takes a little bit longer great but uh, give it a chance because it's just stunning stuff it really is so after Handel let's take one of his colleagues his name was Avison. A-V-I-S-O-N. And Avison wrote all kinds of concertos. He churned them out again. I mean, they're not like thousands of them, but there's several sets of them. And they're very, very enjoyable. He was in the English provinces. He wasn't a London-born composer. And his music, um, his most famous set of concertos, and there are 12, are based on Scarlatti harpsichord sonatas, which is really rather cool. Scarlatti, in case you didn't know, was a Baroque keyboard composer, primarily. I mean, he wrote other things. Everybody did. But what he was known for was going to Spain as the harpsichordist to the Queen of Spain, who was originally the, the Princess of Portugal or something like that. Well, she became the Queen of Spain. And he wrote for her 555 harpsichord sonatas, which were, in those days, shortish works between between three and ten minutes long in two parts, both of which parts would be repeated. And they are brilliant. They're full of Spanish folk influences and the, you know, the sights and sounds of the Spanish culture and city and life that he saw when he was in Spain. And they're brilliant. They're amazing. And we'll have to do something totally separate about them because they're just incredible. Um, but they are a world unto themselves, basically. Scarlatti only published, of the 555, only 33 of them were published in his lifetime. And they made a huge splash in the musical world of the day because they were so brilliant and so much fun and so unlike anything else. Again, genius will out. And so Avison took some of these and, you know, so along with some original music, and he turned them into Concerti Grossi, a la Corelli, by arranging them for string ensemble. And that's what these are. And you don't have to know the Scarlatti originals. You really don't. 
Um, it's just to enjoy these pieces because what survives from what Avison borrowed was just the, the first of all, the wonderful tunefulness and the, the bouncy joy and freedom and excitement of the music. And you can just enjoy, they sparkle. You know, they're like champagne going off. They're, 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 they're delightful works. And they really deserve uh, some, you know, more attention than they get. You don't hear about them very often, but, but they, are, they are smashing pieces. And it's always wonderful in the world of classical music. And there's a lot of this to hear what one composer does with another. And if you like these pieces, then by all means, go and listen to the first 33 Scarlatti sonatas. Not to hear what Avison does, but just to enjoy them for themselves and to introduce yourself to a whole other world of Baroque music that uh, you might not know. So I wanted to include those for that purpose because there's such, such lovely, lovely examples of that, of that trend and how you can use one piece of music as a gateway to an entirely different musical experience. So after Avison, we need to talk about Boyce. Boyce is another contemporary of Handel, and he wrote something called Eight Symphonies. Now, a symphony in, these, in this period, the Baroque period, was not the symphony that it became for Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. It was synonymous with an overture, basically. And in, these, in this case, the symphony was truly the overture to a theatrical work or something else. We were talking about the overture in this case is a freestanding orchestral piece that had a, a long introductory overture and a suite of dances. But here you're talking about music that Boyce actually used um, to introduce his operas or sacred works or other vocal compositions. And he took that music and he arranged them in, in a sequence of, of eight really charming, rather short, you know, somewhere between, you know, five and eight, eight or nine minutes. Uh, pieces that he called symphonies, which are multi-movement pieces uh, that are, you know, just little multi-movement pieces. What can I tell you? He called them symphonies. The Italian sinfonia, um, which is where the word symphony comes from, was actually a Baroque theatrical introductory thing in three movements. It went fast, slow, fast, as opposed to the French overture, which had march, fast, dance things. So there was another kind of form out there, and that Italian sinfonia, the fast, slow, fast thing, is what would develop into the classical symphony. But Boyce's symphonies aren't even that. They are, they are the, the, the music he used for these theatrical productions, arranged really in the form of little suites. And he called them symphonies, and why shouldn't we? because the music is just fresh and lively and lovely, and it's quite, quite popular, and, and it's, been, it's been known really pretty well for the past, oh, you know, half a century or so. Um, you know, a lot of this Baroque music was undiscovered until later in the 20th century, and Boyce is just one of those guys. He published this thing, and we, we look at him and go, ooh, isn't that nice? And no one listens to anything else he did. <laughs> We're only interested in his eight symphonies, which is good. It's enough. It's fine. It's delightful. And finally, finally, we have to talk about Telemann. Now, Telemann was a friend of Bach and Handel. Bach's son, C.P.E. Bach, was the godson of Telemann. Handel and Telemann were friends um, in North Germany. They sort of borrowed from each other <laughs> on various occasions. Um, and, you know, all these people knew each other. And they also all almost married Buxtehude's daughter. That's a story. I just have to tell you. Dietrich Buxtehude was a, the generation before Bach. And he was the organist and major composer in Lübeck, at the Cathedral in Lübeck, which was a major center of North German Baroque music. And, and he was old. And he needed to find a replacement. And he had a deal with the town that the replacement would be the man who married his daughter. Well, evidently his daughter may not have been all that appealing because everybody tried out and then they found out what the deal was and they all ran away. So Bach tried out for the job and didn't want it and Handel tried out for it and didn't want it and Handel's friend Matheson supposedly tried out and didn't want it and I don't know if Telemann tried out and didn't want it but you know, the apocryphal story is that everybody did and I feel sorry for, for Anna Buxtehude, that was her name. I mean, you know, she was old, 
older, and he had three daughters, and he wanted to marry off all of them, and none of them were married. So God only knows what the situation was over there in Lubeck. But what happened ultimately is that Anna was married to a guy named Johann Schieferdecker, who took Buxtehude's job, and immediately Lubeck ceased to become a musical capital of North German Baroque music because Johann Schieferdecker was no Buxtehude. And that's the story. But anyway, Telemann was the major composer in Hamburg, and he had a patent for publishing music, most of which was his own, and he wrote, people say, more music than anyone in history. We, we're talking thousands of pieces, unbelievable quantities of pieces. And because he wrote so much, he has been you know, regarded as somebody who was facile and not terribly interesting, of course because nobody ever listened to what he wrote. But if you do, oh my, there's wonderful, wonderful stuff, as you might expect. And he wrote dozens of orchestral suites, and a lot of them are programmatic and quite, quite interesting. Lots of fun. I mean, there, he did a, a suite based on Don Quixote, for example. He did all of this stuff where he illustrates these pieces in his suites, and they're delicious. And I will be talking about you know, quite a few of them in the normal videos on, class, on, on ClassicsToday.com, which is my, my, review, my review website, but also in these YouTube videos because they are, they're really, really worth hearing and they're wonderful. One of the best is called Water Music. It's also called Hamburg Ebb und Flute or something like that, or flus or fluters. It's, it's, it's Hamburg, you know, ebbs and floods, because Hamburg is a big port city. And if you've, you know, it's on the Elbe River, and there's this giant lake in the middle called the Alster. And uh, obviously it must have, the tides come in and the tides go out, and sometimes the city might have gotten flooded. But he wrote something for Hamburg, the city, called Water Music. And it's very different from the other water music you may have heard of by Handel. Handel's water music was called that because it was written to be performed on a barge floating down the River Thames for the King's River excursions. Telemann's is quite different. Telemann's is about the city of Hamburg, and each of the movements is named after a water nymph, a sort of a mythological being, and it's supposed to embody the character of that mythological being. And so, uh, you know, if you get this piece, you can, you can look and see who the mythological beings are. I'm not going to go into it here. I just wanted to point out that these programmatic overtures by Telemann contain some of the most, most colorful and joyous music ever written in the Baroque period and fabulously imaginative. Telemann was famous for, for borrowing from every kind of national music and synthesizing it all into a wonderful kaleidoscopic range of colorful and, and fantastic, fantastically enjoyable forms. He wrote billions of concertos, he wrote zillions of suites, and lots of everything else in between. It's extraordinary stuff, and there is tons of it. And if you like it, if you like it, you can go explore it at your leisure because there will never be a shortage. I guarantee you that. So those are the forms, essentially, of Baroque music. To summarize, the concerto, which comes in two flavors, the solo concerto and the concerto grosso with large and small ensembles. And then there's the suite, which usually begins with an overture followed by a series of dances, all of which is united by the presence of the harpsichord continuo underneath and whatever else these people call these things, symphonies or capriccios or whatever they call them, you will hear that continuo, you will see these sweet type construction forms, unless they're concertos, in which case you see concerto type construction forms. That is Baroque music in a nutshell. Go get it. Thank you for joining me and keep on listening. <laughs>